Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about the um, cardiology short cases and the PACES examination. So this is an outline of what will be covered today. We'll be going through the types of cases uh, in an approach, some physical examination tips, uh, the importance of having differentials, going through specific conditions, how you would present a short case, investigations, then management. So as we begin, um, for any of the stations, it's important to know the types of cases that actually come up for the exam. Um, so there are four main types of cases. The first is uh, standard valve pathologies that most of us are familiar with, usually stenosis or regurgitant uh, problems that can come either as singular isolated lesions or in combinations. Um, the second group uh, are the valve replacements that can be singular or dual. Um, the third group would be what I term the simple congenital defects. So these would include septal defects, hokum, coarctation, or PDA. And the fourth group, which is often the uh, feared group of conditions in the PACES, a cardiology short case, is the complex congenital defects, often in a young patient with scars uh, in someone who's oftentimes cyanotic. So we'll go through some of them in greater detail in the next few slides. So this uh, slide on the approach is not exactly a systematic step-by-step -step approach, but it focuses on several key features that I find uh, helpful. So we'll talk about them one by one. So first, when it comes to the young patient, um, I would avoid early commitment to a specific diagnosis, uh, especially if we notice uh, any scars of the patient is cyanotic. Um, because uh, oftentimes there are many possibilities in these patients. So one might choose to adopt the following approach by commenting that the patient is young, um, describe the presence or absence of syndromic features, um, whether the patient is cyanotic, acyanotic, the presence of scars. Um, so beyond just your usual median synotomy scars, it's important to look out for uh, scars or shunts, and the presence of uh, any murmurs hurt. Uh, then one can go on to um, talk about differentials uh, for these findings. So the next would be scars. So the three main causes for scars, in particular, um, median synotomy scars would be valve replacements, uh, corrective or palliative uh, surgery for congenital or acquired heart diseases, and uh, previous uh, bypass surgery scars. When it comes to the cyanotic patients, there are two main um, Diff etiological differentials. The first would be Eisenmangers and the second would be uh, some form of congenital cyanotic heart disease. Um, in patients with Eisenmangers, they will invariably have pulmonary hypertension because of the shunt reversal and hence they would have a lot of uh, pulmonary component of the second heart sound as well as possibly a parasternal heave. Um, clubbing and evaluating the, the type and distribution of clubbing is important to elucidate and distinguish between PDAs, VSDs and ASDs. Uh, and there might be concomitant PRs and TRs uh, as a complication of the pulmonary hypertension. In patients with uh, congenital cyanotic heart disease, uh, they can be untreated or palliated because if they are treated, then they should technically not be cyanotic anymore. Um, important to evaluate for BT shunts to um, auscultate for whether the shunt is patent, appreciate uh, the adequacy and the equality of the pulse volume uh, to see whether or not one shunt is functioning better than the other. Um, to evaluate for dextrocardia and to describe the murmurs and offer possible causes. In such instances, it might not be possible to uh, confidently state a single pathology. One may attempt to tie the um, different findings in, in a uh, unifying diagnosis like PDA, uh, sorry, like tetralogy or fellow, for example, um, but one can also choose to describe them and um, provide uh, possibili uh, different possibilities. So these are a few physical examination tips. Uh, of course, uh, before one prepares for the exam, it's important to systematically go through um, the cardiology physical examination. Uh, but these are some areas that I feel are worthwhile um, paying attention to. So the first is the pulse. When we talk about the collapsing pulse, it's important to ensure that the arm is adequately extended rather than partially flexed because uh, in a partially flexed uh, um, the water hammer effect may be compromised and one may then um, perceive a false uh, negative. Pulse volume is something that I find um, helpful. Uh, it may not be an absolute hard sign, but uh, in conditions like aortic regurgitation, uh, mitral regurgitation sometimes too, you tend to get a slightly higher pulse volume. And in conditions like aortic stenosis, you will notice that the pulse volume is weaker. Um, 
So the next is the neck. Uh, I find it worthwhile inspecting the neck uh, at the bedside because uh, if I notice any prominent uh, pulsation, uh, I will attempt to see whether and distinguish whether this is a V-wave uh, in the case of TR or whether it's Corrigan signs in the context of aortic regurgitation. Next, we talk about the apex beats. Um, the apex beat is important. Uh, if one is unable to um, feel it, it's important to accentuate it in the left lateral position uh, and then to check that the patient is not dextrocardic before saying that uh, one is unable to appreciate the apex beat. Um, it's important to consider other sites of auscultation, especially in younger patients where there is uh, suspicion for congenital conditions. Uh, in the case of uh, BT shunts, you can uh, auscultate over the infraclavicular region and in the back in conditions such as coarctation or pulmonary stenosis where there can be radiation to the back. So we often talk about the importance of peripheral signs and using that to guide your diagnosis. Um, I find this uh, to be something helpful, but it's also important to use it with caution. Um, I think it's important as one practices for the uh, short cases to be able to first and foremost um, weigh and identify which signs are harder than others and also to be um, cognizant of one's ability to pick up certain signs and hence uh, um, accrue uh, an appropriate weightage of those signs uh, in the overall picture of the condition. So this slide's on differentials. I won't be going through the differentials for each of the following murmurs, but I think the take-home message is important uh, for one to be able to have differentials for each type of murmur over each particular site because um, sometimes and in fact oftentimes in the basis examination, uh, one may not necessarily come to a uh, single diagnosis. And if one is able to come up with um, appropriate differentials, um, that would uh, enable one to still do adequately well in the case. Um, of note, it's important to be able to come up with differentials for the presence of concomitant systolic and diastolic murmurs. A common case would be that uh, of a patient with aortic regurgitation. Um, many of these patients also have a concomitant systolic murmur um, that's a flow murmur uh, over the aortic valve in systole. Um, if there is no radiation to the carotids, this is most likely just a flow murmur rather than a concomitant aortic stenosis. Um, some of the other differentials are listed here. So it's important uh, for one to think through um, these uh, possibilities and be able to piece them together in the context of the exam. I've also provided differentials for loud first and second heart sounds. So we then talk about specific conditions. Um, the following two slides will be um, the regurgitant and stenotic murmurs, uh, pathologies that we are familiar with, and the next slide would then be the rare congenital uh, lesions. So in terms of studying, uh, for details about these conditions, we can think of it in terms of etiology, associated uh, features and severity markers, as well as surgical indications. I tend to group my etiologies based on acquired and congenital, um, with, the, with the exception of uh, aortic regurgitan, regurgitation, where one may choose uh, to think of it in terms of whether it's acute or chronic. So um, one can look through the details of the slides. Uh, yeah, and uh, if one is stuck in terms of the possible etiological differentials, um, infective endocarditis and rheumatic heart disease can technically affect any valve, so you can fill that in as a etiological differential. And surgical ind uh, indications uh, in general uh, would include patients with uh, symptomatic, uh, who, are, who remain symptomatic despite uh, maximal medical therapy, who are undergoing concomitant open heart surgery for any other reason. Uh, or have um, certain severity markers based on uh, echocardiographic or, or physiological testing uh, parameters. So if one finds it difficult to remember all the details about surgical indications, um, you can provide a motherhood statement as such. So this slide is a very busy slide about some of the rarer conditions. I'll leave it to you to read through the details, but I think it's important to at least have a overview of what are the features, um, and how one approaches uh, these different conditions. Okay, we next move on to the presentation. So I always uh, encourage uh, candidates to um, have the habit of completing the physical examination or beginning the presentation with their wish list. So um, by stating that they would like to review the blood pressure and temperature charts, um, performing a urine dipstick for microscopic hematuria and a fundoscopy for raw spots. Um, 
in terms of the presentation, if one is very confident, uh, especially for either a um, valve replacement or single valve pathology, one can state the diagnosis up front, then talk about the type of murmur, where it's best heard, the grade and radiations, with relevant supportive peripheral features and severity markers. Um, I also like to inculcate the habit of um, commenting on the heart sounds, presence of other murmurs, the apex meet, and the pulse uh, for all cardiology cases. And then we talk about complications with a standard list of um, the mnemonic I use is PICA for pulmonary hypertension, i.e. CCF, and atrial fibrillation. Uh, and if there are prosthetic valves, to consider the presence of valve thrombosis, valve leaks, and hemolysis. Then one can go on to talk about the etiology. For non-standard cases, uh, one may choose to adopt a more descriptive approach. So as mentioned, uh, this is usually the young patient, then comment whether it's synotic, asynotic, describe the scar scene, uh, the presence of murmurs with relevant differentials, heart sounds, apex beat, uh, important to comment whether or not there's extracardia and for the pulse, especially in the context of a BT shunt, uh, to comment uh, whether the pulse is equal uh, in volume. Investigations wise um, are fairly standard. I tend to avoid um, provision of too much details. So I would generally say I like to perform an electrocardiogram looking for arrhythmias and chamber enlargement rather than stating the specific um, findings because one can often uh, trip over um, these details in the context of the exam. Then I'll talk about a plain chest radiograph looking for features of fluid overload and an echocardiogram to confirm the diagnosis, evaluate severity and etiology and assess for complications. In the context of a prosthetic valve, it's important to screen for the coagulation profile, especially if the patient also has uh, atrial fibrillation and is on anticoagulation. Um, when there's suspicion of hem hemolytic anemia, to do a full blood count, LDH, and a relevant hemolysis screen. Uh, and if one wants to evaluate the function for a prosthetic valve or fluoroscopy would be the investigation of choice. So management, once again, uh, this set of, uh, the details here are intended to be a uh, big picture and generalizable. So it will be a multidisciplinary management involving the cardiologist, allied health staff anchored in patient education, uh, with focus on smoking cessation and control of cardiovascular risk factors and cardiopulmonary pulmonary rehabilitation. There's generally a limited role for medical therapy in valvular pathology, but heart failure treated with goal-directed medical therapy and diuretics um, should be commenced. Uh, patients who remain symptomatic despite best medical therapy can be considered for surgery, and surgery can either be replacement or repair uh, with approaches of either um, open-heart surgery or minimally invasive uh, through percutaneous or transapical approaches. And in patients with AF, it's important to talk about anticoagulation. So um, I hope you found the slides useful. I think the take-home message is to, um, of course, prepare for the standard cases and be prepared to ace them if you get them. But in the more complex um, cases, uh, younger patients with many scars, it's important to have a calm, systematic approach uh, in handling them and um, just go through uh, things in a systematic fashion and be able to provide differentials for the things that you hear and the scars that you see. So that would be it. Thank you.